3DPA is a, is a, is a program that is, uh, I think, nine years old at the moment, um, in which we are working with 3D printing and with Earth, as I imagine all of you know uh, quite well, um, because you're here. So the, the question, of course, uh, or, or let's say the general context in which we sit is a context of the necessity necessity to construct, yet the construction, the construction industry being one of the most harmful industry in today's world, and together with this idea of, of, of how do we need to build today no? in a world that gets incre increasingly standardized, where we try somehow to reproduce the same building solutions throughout the world, whether we sit in one part of the world or in, in another, uh, that use the same resources, that use the same type of spatial typology, uh, that pretends that every single one of us needs the same living conditions, whoever we are, wherever we are. No? And this is, these are definitely questions that we are very much driven by. Um, 3D PA sits in IAC, a school that, that has, uh, you know, many research projects, many master's program, educational program. Um, it's a school in which we thrive by using technology and try really to get this to inform the way that we work, the way that we think, the way that we design. Um, this is some examples of or some photographs of our of our teams, no? uh, the team that, that we work with, team of students, team of faculty, and also a little bit in, in action. Now, 3D printing with Earth, it's, it's kind of sometimes it seems to even appear as a kind of contradiction because Earth is a very old material, construction material, and 3D printing is a very new technology. So let me start a little bit with the Earth. No? Earth is a material that is very interesting for many reasons for us. Um, it's a material that is, let's say, first of all, it's very little used to be in construction because it has been replaced by other uh, construction techniques or materials such as uh, cement and concrete that are high energy consumption materials. So Earth, we believe, is a strong alternative to this. No? And, and, and for the reasons that you might see or recognize through these images, first of all, it's a material that has always been used in architecture. Therefore, uh, it has always been used, especially in pre-industrial times. No? Therefore, we can find techniques uh, of, of how to work with this material throughout the world that are incredibly interesting. Techniques of construction, techniques of passive, passive construction, techniques of, um, you know, of construction to be able to create habitat that functions without electricity or without energy, and so on. No? Um, it is being used today, so it's being used today in, 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 in many different techniques, uh, actually not just 3D printing, as, uh, as I imagine some of you know, and it's interesting because it's a material that is fully recyclable, no? so it's possible to build with earth without adding any uh, additives that contaminate the material, therefore it means that you can use the material from underneath your feet, uh, build in a very much kilometer zero, uh, you will see that in the presentation format, um, and create a building that is very clean in the sense that the material is natural. The last point about Earth is that it's a material that is incredibly available. No? There is actually, uh, there is actually, um, uh, there is actually too much earth. We don't know what to do with it. Uh, cities bring earth out of their cities when they do industrial work or when they do foundation work for large buildings. And this earth is actually not only available, it's also free, you know, and it's also uh, something that we need to use in order to, um, to avoid uh, this, this, this kind of consequence of long travels. Of course, it's also not an easy material. That is why, uh, you know, other materials have been preferred to in the past higher consumption, uh, energy consumption material. So, clay, for example, or earth might crack when you work with it. So you will see some examples. We actually try really to understand how to work with that. Um, earth is a material that requires a certain maintenance. Uh, you know, it needs to be protected from water. It has its kind of specific conditions of how to build with. It cannot be dealt with in the same way than concrete, for instance. And also earth is a material that works very strongly in compression and not so much in tension. So this is a, this, this in terms of design, in terms of architecture means that we have to kind of think about the type of space that can be done. We cannot go to huge spans. We need to do an architecture that is rather domestic of small spaces. Um, this, the state of the art of earth construction today, you can see a little bit here. No? Well, first of all, uh, on top left, you can see images of you know these 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 kind of earth skyscraper cities in Yemen, uh, buildings that are six hundred years old that are thirteen stories high. That is just to say that earth is actually a, a, a very 
uh, stable construction material, I get very often asked this question, oh, how, how durable can it be? Well, this is the answer. Then afterwards, whether it's in Africa with Francisca Ray and many other architects and builders that work there, in Europe, um, uh, in, in, in different places, here we have an image from Austria, another one from Spain, earth is being currently used as a construction material and provides actually for very good buildings, very good architecture. Um, historically, I mentioned it's been used, and for us, this is extremely interesting because we see all sorts of techniques, construction techniques, but also passive cooling techniques, uh, and, 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 and using earth in order to create an architecture that is very much a climatic dispositive. So for us, this is extremely interesting in order to go and study and potentially to reinvent or rethink about what this means today. But Earth is also stigmatized, right? Earth somehow represents or very often uh, and, and stands to an image of an architecture that is old, an architecture that is for the poor of communities that might not be able to afford more modern building. There is a stigma about this, which is something that we believe with 3D printing and with looking for a kind of new architecture, we believe that we can overcome. So a couple of words on 3D printing. I guess most of you are relatively acquainted to this, um, uh, to this, to this technology. No, 3D printing is a technology that's that's that is. Uh, by now actually very affordable of course depending on its scale so we are very we all have seen for sure some of the, the desktop 3d printers which by the way we use in the program we can get them for you know for for 300 dollars for example um, and then this spans of course to the really large scale for example of uh, concrete printing on an architectural scale no? so um why is why is 3d printing interesting in uh in the construction industry uh at the moment um, I, I i believe you might know but concrete is being used by quite a lot of construction companies in order to um in order to create building solutions and i and and, and this is driven very much at the moment by kind of economical uh advantages and also large construction companies benefit by using but benefit by using 3D printing from automating the building process, uh, meaning that they actually create, can create buildings larger, um, sorry, not larger, but faster, uh, and also by, uh, by actually using less people, no? therefore reducing the economy of them. 3D printing is definitely enable construction to be more efficient. Um, but this is not the only thing that we are interested in in the in the program, or let's say as architects, we believe that 3D printing also can enable um, uh, quite an interesting set of flexibility when it comes to design, to be able to escape formats of standardization in construction and to be able to start to custom made solutions for different problems. No? So that is something that can happen on the scale of the wall, the scale of design of detail, uh, but also on the scale of the space, on the spatial distribution uh, of, you know, even the distribution of a settlement uh, or a small village, for example. What's interesting for us about 3D printing, of course, it is because since it is a, re a robotic technology, it of course uh, enables this door to digital uh, tech. No, and this is something that we use not only in terms of design, in terms of modeling, but also we use it uh, in terms of analysis, as you see in the in the center, digital analysis, but also sometimes even going to physical analysis using tools such as Arduino, thermal camera, in this case, that enables us to monitor and to understand certain behaviors uh, of the materials or the geometries that we work with. And then, you know, 3D printing is often called rapid prototyping. That is because it's quite quick, actually, with this technology to prototype, you know, something that without the printer might be very costly or a very time-consuming process. In this case, we asked our students throughout the program to create at least 100 prints uh, you know, throughout the six months. This is something that happens on the small scale, as you can see on the left, but also on uh, on the right, you can see one-to-one -one constructions that our, our students did last year, I think after two weeks of having joined the program. So here you can see structural tests, testing immediately on a one-to-one -one scale, what can, uh, what can happen. So, um, I'm going to uh, explain a little bit this process or this project from four perspectives. Um, the first one is, uh, so this, this, uh, this slide I will skip, the first one is the one of the detail. So uh, if we are able to put material only where we need uh, to put it, that means that we actually are thinking about how to detail a building and how to detail certain parts of the building in a relatively different manner. So here you see um, 
images of our the work that we do in collaboration with WASP, which is an Italian company that works with uh, that develops printers and also does uh, earth architecture. You see here the inside of a wall, you can see the porosity, you can see that we don't work with fully um, massive wall, but we actually work with networks of cavities. Um, and then this kind of small deformation of the surface that you can see in this case help us in order to relate to two timber elements. In this case, it's a tap, uh, but in Nigeria, it's a window, a door, or many other different construction elements that we use. So you can see here how kind of uh, structural work, very localized structural work, enables us to create a certain deformation where these pieces of timber can slot in, slide in, and and um, and and eventually. Uh, give the performance of what a step needs to do and takes advantage of the compressive character of this material that is above. Here you see the building process. We work with 20 or 30 centimeters per day to enable the, the material underneath to dry and to not uh, collapse under the weight of whatever comes on top. Uh, so 20, 30 centimeters a day. That means that we do approximately a story. We can do, we can print up to a story in let's say eight to 10 days. So here you see the result and the, and the check by our colleagues at WASP that are depending on these steps uh, to show that they actually work, right? That Earth can actually take this, uh, take this weight. Um, this is a collaboration that we did with two other universities together with our students, actually two other universities and, and industrial partners. So we work with TITA, a school in Denmark, and, and ITKE. Um, in Stuttgart, where the three of us, the three kind of groups, brought different materialities. So we worked with clay, um, and you can see here the other material. So on the left, cellulose 3D printed panel that were developed at CETA, and on the right, you can see these slabs, fiber reinforced slabs, robotically made by ITQ. You know, and and in the in the middle, you can see clay walls that were printed by our students in order to go precisely and touch these other materialities and uh, and 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 reach towards the kind of constructive language in an architecture that is not only about one material but about the different uh, the different combinations. Uh, or other combinations with different other materials or different techniques. The other aspect after talking about details is I want to talk about performance and more specifically performance when it comes to climate. So earth is an interesting material when it comes to the thermal performance. You know, it has a good inertia. Uh, and of course, um, working with 3D printing can enable us to create sometimes custom-based uh, geometries or shape that can relate to the, to the path of the sun. This is an exercise that we did with our students to develop a kind of passive uh, passive fridge. And what you see in, in these images, so these are thermal images, so the images that translate the, car, the, the, the temperature into colors, you can see here this test by our research team that's doing a wall with a certain network of pumps enables uh, to create a to kind of cast a shadow of itself and therefore to create different thermal pockets within a wall. That is something that can be useful in order to, for example, accumulate heat or Eva or evacuate heat through a system of ventilation, which you will see in a moment. Um, this I will not go through. This is basically the the, the, the kind of uh, the, the, the kind of bringing this uh, idea of these images or so this theory to an architectural scale and to try to confront it to uh, the size of a wall, um, a wall that needs to be you know uh, cooled down in the summer. And, uh, uh, and, and and needs to capture the heat in the in the winter. So a wall that has kind of two purposes. So this is a prototype that was done. Everything that you see here was done by um, our students, our our team. Um, what you see here is 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 a is a plan of the wall where you can see this network of cavities. The first cavity uh, being the ventilation cavities. Uh, and then afterwards, some cavities that are used for insulation and other, uh, other cavities that are used for math. Here you see, because this is at a time where we were, this is five or six years ago. This is a time that when we were still printing with, a, uh, you know, with our robotic arm at Ajax. Since then we have, let's say, much more, um, I don't know, advanced, but at least larger equipment. You can see here the technical drawing that shows the connection between these different parts, which are printed here, assembled. Um, and then here you can see this on site in, in our green campus of Valdaura, where the wall actually starts to perform its self-shading uh, function. You can see on the bottom right the kind of thermal analysis uh, that comes out of it. So here you can see this is a five meter high prototype. Uh, you can see on the bottom these little black spots that refer to the, or that show actually the way that 
these cavities from which the air comes in and it travels all the way up until the top and evacuates the heat. Uh, one of our students here that is that is uh, that is standing on the flap that we constructed behind, um, and this idea was was taken to the, the um, in, a, in a kind of collaboration with UN Habitats, we've had in the past, was taken to the question of the refugee camp, no, where very often what we see uh, or, or the solutions that are brought there is the, is the repetition of an element that is imported that is supposed to be temporary but that lasts a very long time. So. Rather than importing the house, rather than importing the material, is there a way to rather bring the tool and use the local material in order to create an architecture that is not an architecture of temporality, but an architecture of durability? So, of course, in order to do that, to understand what kind of design, um, there is the need to do kind of intensive analysis to look at the different building typologies that are there, and of course, to confront and to understand these typologies to the let's say local climate and to the local building conditions this is one of the proposals that comes out where there is a kind of partial game of extracting inside you know and um, making a hole into the ground by taking the earth that we need in order to print that is something that from a thermal point of view is also interesting and then designing according to the sun path diagram a series of houses that can be uh, that can be lived in i think it's it's a uh, a very beautiful project that, that has come out here from, from this group of students. And I think that shows a possible reality that we believe could be implemented in such a complex situation, such as a refugee camp. Um, um, the, the, the next project is a project that also deals with, uh, with temperature, but from a very different perspective. We believe earth architecture, no, we sometimes think that earth architecture is, is interesting for hot and dry climate. It of course is, but it's also interested in, 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 in all of the other climates. And here we have, uh, you know, some students that joined us from Kazakhstan uh, and that worked on the reality of the country where we work actually with a very cold uh, climate. So what the students did here is to understand whether a wall, because, a 3D printed wall, because of its, um, uh, um, capacity to be full of cavities can actually vehiculate heat within it. No? So it's interesting when you see this orange arrow uh, in here is, is actually the students have been developing a way to work. We call this performative design, which is rather than drawing the wall, we actually draw the path of the heat. And then when the path of the heat is correct, then we actually generate the geometries that go around it in order to achieve that performance. So you can see here uh, some of these drawings, research drawing, and then here eventually the prototype that the students did. And this image that I like a lot where you see a wall that is, seems to be relatively homogeneous, but when you have the image of the thermal camera, you can see that the heat within this wall is not distributed uh, in, a, in a homogeneous manner, but there is actually a pattern that was designed by the designers or by the students in this case. So here you see the, the wall. Um, and here you see the thermal image that reflects the kind of pattern of cavities that happen with it. So of course, this is something that then they take to a larger scale uh, and then start to really you know, custom made, uh, custom design all of the walls of a house in order to understand all of the slabs, walls of a house as a network of cavities that distributes heat in a non-homogeneous manner around uh, a piece of architecture. And you can see some of these images uh, the render where, where where you see even the fireplace and then definitely the heat of this fireplace going uh, on the bottom of the bed of some of the people that go and sleep upstairs. Another way to understand performance is in terms of structure and structure is 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 incredibly I would say difficult with earth but it's also interesting because there is a history an incredible history worldwide of uh, architecture that works in compression, no? predominantly, predominantly stone, but all of this is for us food for, for, for research. So the, the, the address of, of the structural property, of uh, the structural performance can be done from a formal point of view, looking at the geometry, being able to print in a way a uh, certain assembly so that you bring mass here, mass there, and are able to have certain mass to kind of take care of some overhangs. Um, and you can see here a bit the result of that work, no very rigorous work by our students where they're testing all of the geometries, printing them to demonstrate whether they work or not, and seeing how a certain form can actually inform um, the structure and create a better structure. No? Same with this idea of the catenary, understanding the section in which you know compressive stress 
stresses can best be uh, brought uh, to the ground. Um, yeah, in this in this process of working, I like this slide where we are both drawing and making at the same time. We, we like to say that for every print, we can make a hundred drawings. So there is always this back and forth process between design and making. Um, tools that we use, that we that we make actually, so this is a custom made tool in, in Grasshopper that colorizes the surface according to the angle. So, you know, you can imagine that the, 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 the stronger the angle, the more likely the surface is to collapse. And we have been doing many tests over the years that tells us that over 20 degrees, we cannot print. So this is a tool that when you model your surface, gives you the color coding you can set up your, your, your angles to tell you at which point, in which area of the surface will the material not hold itself and the print will collapse. So these are tools that we can fit in, uh, of course, within the design process and that are very useful. Here you can see also some of the, 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 the methodology of modeling that is highly difficult. Uh, it's fun, it's a lot of fun, but it's also difficult where we see uh, how you know every plan of the house changes because this is not a set of extruded walls. Um, the parametric uh, design that comes behind it, understand how to parametrize the 3D model, how to work with the connections where different surfaces touch each other, uh, but also understand how to kind of work very precisely with all of these geometries. Then how, one of these, uh, you know, one of these can become a unit within a larger whole, potentially, um, the printing of it. And, and, and here you see a kind of strategy of proliferation, or having demonstrated on the small scale, the students were able to develop little by little a much larger uh, architecture where the scale of these units uh, or of these, let's say, um, uh, uh, pockets of, of space change in scale and, and develop. You see the elevation, the section of an architectural proposal, and eventually uh, an image of what would be uh, of what would be constructed. No, this is image. This is work that is very fresh from this year. Uh, this is this was developed by a group of students back in February this year. Another example is how working with the surface, um, doing little manipulation, geometrical manipulation to the surface within three D modeling is able to give. Um, a better structural behavior. So this is, of course, something that is not just done from a kind of intuitive point of view, but it's actually also done very rigorously, mapping the colors, uh, understanding the, the kind of structural, um, uh, um, the structural inertias uh, that happen within uh, within some of these surfaces. No, and the way that we work, you see, is that we don't print all of the things that we draw. We draw or model. We analyze, and then based on these analysis, and of course on debate and on some reflection, some of these go to print, and we try to do this in a very rigorous manner so that as many get printed and then they can be compared, right? So this is here, I'm showing this slide because this is extremely good work that was done by some of our students three or four years ago, very, very rigorously. And you can see that we work a lot through this technique of cataloging, not trying to draw one option, we're drawing all of the options that exist and little by little narrowing down until we believe that we have the best one. So here you can see this back and forth, some, some parts that, uh, that collapse, uh, others not. And then eventually here you can see a larger prototype being made that combines different types of footprints uh, and different types of shapes. No? Here you can see the printing process. I like the image on the right, which is the, the finished one, but I really like these process images where you can see actually that the surface is anything but singular. It is composed of a, of a, of a line that folds back and forth on itself and creates structural inertia throughout the print. No? I think this is fantastic work. The another strategy that we use is to bring fibers within the material. So uh, you see um, in, in these examples, designing the footpath, uh, also not the footpath, the printing path according to fibers that you can stretch in order to start to give tension, um, a tensile behavior to the to the to the to the prints, right? So you can see here. Uh, some analysis that are being done that understand in which area the surface is weaker than others. And this is the place where we're precisely going to choose in order to start to weave, in this case, uh, a fiber uh, a fiber network. No? This is something that is done 
during the print uh, with the students actually had in this case do by hand, but this is of course a technique that we imagine would be uh, would be um, automated uh, and done by the 3D printer or by other uh, automated means. Another example where we see quite a, a beautiful design that is very much informed by a huge network of, uh, of strings. Um, but the last one I want to show in this realm uh, is, 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 uh, is this project here where what you see is an insertion of a fiber every five printing layers. So you can see that, that this is again, something that is being done by hand, but would be automated. And you can see here the formal studies of the geometry, because since students are able to place fibers within the print, we are able to go into deeper cantilever, you know, into more daring cantilevering. And of course, this is done by analyzing structurally the, the form, but also the, the, the question of the overhand. And here is the, the, the picture that shows not only the machine that they constructed and use in order to lay the, the, the 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 fibers very precisely but also you can see how this form that is all composed out of straight lines on plan starts to become very three-dimensional and offers possibilities for overhangs and for the creation of wall assemblies that are not necessarily extruded another example here which unfortunately didn't get constructed this is from the work from the student this year where they're also developing a new way to kind of spread the, 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 the fibers only in the areas where the structure actually really needs it. No? So this is an image of a little competition we did this year in the program uh, of one of the proposals um, to, 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 uh, to construct a small pavilion. The last way to work with structure is, um, is uh, working with support systems. So what you see here is um, extremely simple well, we believe extremely simple wooden structure that we can make in a very standardized manner without any digital manufacturing technique so that the printer can go uh, and print on top. Well, this is something that is done with a half um, volt and here with a full volt. Of course, the big questions of the retraction of the clay. So we started to build timber structure that can also retract. That's why you see a piston up there. So the structure is moving together with the movement of the clay during the drying process. And uh, you don't have to believe me, but by now this prototype that we see here, we have removed the, the support system and this is still standing. And of course, if you don't believe me, then you are invited to, uh, to IAC because this prototype is there, can be seen and we are all uh, inviting you to come and have a look at it. This is the speculation that then comes on an architectural level from the student because we like, you know, to demonstrate things on a physical scale uh, and then afterwards to kind of speculate into an architectural project. So this is the type of project that could come out of the implementation of a technique like this, where you see uh, these kind of uh, beautiful folds that are done above in order to shape a space for student, ha in ha uh, student housing in this case. Here, what the construction process might look like. This year, this is something that we played with a lot. Uh, we worked actually with active bending, so bending a piece of wood, taking advantage of the fact that it has a curvature, which is something that is extremely good for the drying of the clay. So here you can see some of the successful attempts from our students to print on an extremely thin layer of timber uh, and to get this layer of timber to shrink together with the shrinking of the earth. So many different proposals were, were, were being developed. Um, and then eventually we went into the construction of a prototype in Valdaura. So this is our prototype of this year. Here you can see the different steps uh, of, uh, you know, these several tons of clay that are being laid uh, on these very thin timber. So here is some of the, the development um, where you can see the retraction potential of this, uh, of this kind of timber column and these timber, uh, these timber strips that are there. There you go, printing on thin, uh, on thin timber. Here's some of the photographs of this year's uh, building site. And um, yeah, I see that I'm uh, speaking very long. So I'm gonna go a little bit fast through the slide. I think it's nice that you see them nevertheless. This is some of the architecture that was then being developed by the students after the construction of this prototype, where you can see an animation of 
um, of the vaulted assembly. We can see all of these surfaces that through this flipping plane animation, little by little appear. This is of course exactly what the printing process would be, you know, the support system and these geometries that slowly go. Here is a project that comes out, placing this on the, or locating this or deploying this on the, on the landscape for a student housing proposal uh, with a very interesting climatic section that was being developed. And then eventually here, some images of what, uh, of what these, uh, these, uh, these houses might look like um, from the inside and from the outside. Another proposal working again with this bending system, but working in a much more vertical manner. So students actually really understanding the, the structure of a building, the organization of a building, how to circulate, and how can you know this flexibility that we have with 3D printing enable to make a building that doesn't repeat uh, on every floor, no? but that starts to have an organization that can match different necessities. Um, Within, within it. So here's the, the, the outcome of this proposal. And then, um, oh, I thought we had an image. Ah, yeah, here, an image of what the construction would look like, you know, that I that I found very, uh, very nice. This network of cranes, uh, this network of timber support, and then uh, eventually these, these, uh, these three different walls that go up. The last, uh, so I, I've talked about flexibility in details. I've talked about flexibility in performance when it comes to um, when it comes to, to climate and then when it comes to structure. Now I want to talk on a larger scale and I want to talk about how flexibility on a master plan level or on a, uh, or on a, on a, on a kind of distribution level because of the fact that we don't need to work with standardized elements. So this is a project that some of our students developed in an area of informal housing um, in Venezuela, where actually the plots of land are anything but square, rectangular, uh, developed from an economical model, they actually appear. And, and so there's the necessity to actually work with pockets of space and, and to work with plots that are never really um, as orthogonal as buildings often are in our cities. So this again goes through a kind of analysis of vernacular architecture, of the way that communities live, of the material that they use that are kilometer zero um, and, that are, uh, and, that are, and that are natural. So here in the implementation of a, of a proposal, uh, in a hot and humid, hot, hot and humid um, uh, climate, therefore an area in which a building needs to have very high level of porosity, uh, as you can see on these images, no? this hovering roof that protects from heavy rains and then afterwards this architecture that is very transparent and very porous in order to sweat all of the heat uh, that can be accumulated. That is very much the, the kind of uh, type of 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 of, uh, of um, climatic performance that is needed in this sort of climate, and then uh, that's the last little project I'm going to show before uh, showing you one to one construction, which is about how you know thinking about what a window means um, and 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 the different size that a window can take. No? So an opening with three D printing is very different from one in the masonry wall. Of course, it needs to be able to be to be thought in terms of um, in terms of uh, let's say gravity and how the material organizes. So this is here, I think, very nice prototype done by our students where they've been exploring precisely this question of the overhang and what kind of opening can be done within a clay wall and then understanding this within the depth uh, of a wall assembly. You know, be able to, with, with the use of the, 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 the kind of parametric design software that we use, Grasshopper, uh, to be able to create actually walls that are maybe very transparent from one side and maybe very opaque from another, you know, creating certain visual porosities. And this, uh, in, in this group of students, where two of them were from, um, from Botswana and, and, and South Africa, to be able to create an architecture for a community that is, uh, that is moving from rural area to, um, uh, to urban areas, where at the moment, the housing solution that is being provided is the one that is here in the middle. So uh, that you can see here, actually, a house that is relatively disconnected in its organization and in its construction from how people have been always living in this area. So the, the students actually rather question this and try to propose a housing model that is based on uh, existing ways of building and living that matches the social, the social structures. They created a proposal that is based on the insertion of courtyard and on the development of a settlement that includes actually many families together, no? or, or, or rather over there, the cell, the cell of the family is not the parents and the children, but it's the parents, it's the children, the parents, the grandparents, 
and all of the other um, brothers and sisters families together. And also actually this project is a house designed for 32 uh, people. And of course, this takes a lot of work in terms of organization. They were of course being able to work with this kind of prototype that you've seen before where they are able to control the porosities uh, and create therefore uh, a kind of continuous building fabric that contains courtyards, but also contains little nucleus of privacy within them, which are the bedrooms. And then the further you go away from the centers, the more public the, the, the organization of the plan becomes. You can see an example, and then eventually this very nice render that comes out. So the last little project I show is, is Tova, uh, which is something that our student did last year. Uh, and I think it's been, it's a, for us, a very important, um, a very important part um, where here we see, uh, we've, we've actually gone through the making of a real building. It's a small one and it's a prototype, but nevertheless, it's a real building because it has a key at the end, it has a door with some, you know, with some timber carpentry, and then eventually we're able to close it. So here you can see a little bit through the section of the plan, the, the, the kind of foundation, the slab, the, the walls and the, the, the timber roof. And I'm gonna immediately go through the construction of this. So the foundation is underground. It's made from recycled stones on which there is a membrane. And then here, what we do is we actually cast, we, we actually print a formwork to be able to cast within it uh, an earth mix that also contains some um, some some um, uh, geopolymer, which is residues from the from the building industry that actually have better behavior when it comes to uh, to uh, uh, to water behavior. No, so we've we've casted within this uh, this this uh, uh, this geopolymer, and then whenever it was dry, we've kind of used all of this homework back into printing the walls that go above. Here you can see the printing process. You can see the cavities within the wall, the kind of modification of the geometry to be able to take a timber truss. Um, here you can see the printing process from above. Now we can see very well, uh, despite the fact that this was very massive from the elevation, we can see from above that they contain a little bit more than 50% of earth, actually, uh, sorry, of, um, of air. Um, here, the printing process, the, start, the, the, the insertion of small details, uh, waterproofing uh, details that are being done in order to make sure that water doesn't run along the facade of the building, but hits these kind of pumps and then evacuates, let's say, the wall to, to, to avoid any uh, unnecessarily erosion on this earth surface. And then eventually the work with the, with the, with the timber, no? the, the, this kind of question of tolerance, because the, the earth is not something we work with on a millimeter basis, while timber needs to be much more precise. So here there is, of course, this question of how do these two material systems come in uh, kind of combination one with another. No? And, and you can see here all of these details that are done a timber structure that can adapt to certain movements in the clay. So we we have here some photographs that I that I that I really like to show, but I'm going to jump to the last one, which is this one, where I'm basically standing with my phone in between the building, um, in between the building and myself um, is the hole that we have excavated in order to get the material for the house. No? And there is something very nice when you make a hole in the ground. Okay, I hope I was not muted for a too long time. <laughs> no, no, it was just two seconds. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. So the hole in this, when you make a hole in the ground, what you do is you go and shake all of this, uh, all of this little microcosm and and seeds that have never, um, you know, led to 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 the growth of a plant suddenly do. No? So a few months after we had constructed this, we went back there and we realized that wherever there was the hole that we had done in order to get in order to, to, to print the house, suddenly this hole had led into the growth of an incredible amount of plants. No? And for me this is a very beautiful little example. This is not something we expected or not something we, we decided by but by making a building somehow we created a little patch of, a, of, a, of vegetation, which is something that we found uh, very beautiful. Here is some development of what Tova, uh, this project would be if it was done on a larger scale. So we also do this because we are convinced that we are now ready to go to a, to a larger scale, right? And here is a quick video.
So maybe to, to indicate that usually the studio has a sound with the voice over, but you can find it on YouTube. Um, I'm not sure if it's shared here. You cannot hear the sound, no? No, but it's fine. It's, I mean, it's on YouTube as well. So. So I'm sorry I shared without the sound. So I was the only one that was listening to to uh, uh, to this to this very nice voiceover that is on this video. But we'll share the link so that if you want to watch it, uh, this video of course is is online. Um, the, the the little conclusion of this presentation is that you know architecture is always of course very closely uh, related. The type of spaces that are constructed to the technique that are being used. You no, know, this it has always been like that in history. And these examples that we like to show to our students uh, show that. You no, know, you know whether it's the use of the Japanese saw uh, in in, uh, in in the construction of pagodas in Japan that create uh, these joints that work without uh, screws, to the arrival of steel and that permits the skyscraper, or to the balloon frame, for example, in uh, uh, architecture of the United States that enabled uh, houses to be built by only two or three people. So we are in the program, of course, uh, very interested in, in, in what is archi the architecture of, uh, of, of 3D printing. Uh, and we like this example of the Casa Domino by Le Corbusier and, and the contrast between this building on the left that was done in 1870s, uh, the first uh, reinforced concrete building that was done that seems to be a kind of castle that is made out of totally different material. And then 60 years later, uh, um, 50 years later, after working through this material, little by little, uh, you know, like kind of very interesting ways to work with reinforced concrete uh, appear techniques that are still there today. So if 3D printing is this new technology and Earth is this incredible uh, trivial, what is, what is the architecture that will emerge out of this? Um, this is something I think in the program we are actually trying to, to answer. And, and, and I think we come, we are little by little coming with solutions. There is plenty of work to do and plenty of years to develop this, but this is what we, we, we like to get into. Um, I will do a very, um, I saw that I spoke a lot, but what I wanted to do in order to conclude is to show a little bit the structure of our program. Uh, and then in a couple of minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll open for, uh, for questions. No? So we would like to go through kind of three phases uh, in the program. The first one, uh, it's about learning, let's say they're all about learning. The second one is about exploring and the third one is about demonstrating. So the first phase is a six week long, very intense, Set of workshops where we learn about the machines, we learn about the material, we learn about performative design, we learn certain tools. And then afterwards, we're going to research. So each group, uh, let's say we work in groups of three, they take a research question, for example, how to make a window within a clay wall, and they, de and they develop this through a methodology that is both scientific and, um, and creative. And then afterwards, when we demonstrate, we go to the making of a one-to-one -one prototype in order to demonstrate some of the aspects we've done. And at the same time, we also develop vision projects in which we take these learnings and we speculate on what they mean in terms of an architecture that could come out. Um, yes, so uh, I, will, I will, well, we have this slide here. Uh, we've been getting some, some very nice awards with, with Tova recently. And there is one that is ongoing now. So if you guys want to vote uh, for the new, bar, new European Bauhaus, it's a, it's a research, European research project that is going on at the moment uh, and, and, and in which we are shortlisted. Uh, and of course, we are, we are very excited to, uh, to, uh, to hopefully get an award there. But anyway, that is not so much uh, relevant in, in, uh, in this conversation with you guys. So I think I will leave it here. Uh, maybe Yara can it can give you the word for for a moment in case you 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 want, and I think we are uh, now is maybe the moment to 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 convert this into a conversation to welcome questions and to and to uh, give any clarifications or debate on any question that you think might be relevant. Thank you, Edouard. Um, yeah, thank you, 
That was that was a great insight for a presentation. Even I see it for the first time, I think. <laughs> that was very informative and, and, and uh, interesting to listen to. Uh, no, I think maybe we will just take the time to have all uh, everyone here ask questions. Uh, I will also um, write again my email in the chat so that in case you have a question, you can just email me directly. Uh, but of course, go ahead now and ask your questions. We also have uh, some information on the structure of the program that some of you may already have found online or in the booklet that you may have downloaded or in a conversation with me. So I will not take much time. Uh, we can also go through it. Everyone can go through the slides in case um, you need to. But yeah, please go ahead. Uh, maybe ideally just um, activate your camera so we can see you and uh, ask, uh, ask any questions. That would be that would be nice. Feel free to uh, to yes to activate your camera in case you in case you want because it would be nice to see some 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 faces even if it's really nice already to see some names. <laughs> Hi, can I can I start? Um, I, I think um, we can ask a few questions, right? Is that okay? Absolutely. That's yeah. the game. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, How are you? This is Eddie. Thanks, Edward. Thanks for the presentation. Um, really insightful and very exciting. I, I have to admit that every time I see um, sort of more sort of technology connected to earth and construction, it's very good to see that. Um, I, I was wondering, obviously, there, there are different techniques out there, um, either sort of like historically or are also being experimented with and 3D printing is obviously one of the technology, one of the vehicles to, to work with earth materials. Um, I'm, I'm just curious to understand to what extent um, is the program actually looking at other alternative te techniques as well. Um, so for example, extrusion um, um, molds, uh, mold configuration, um, but also obviously the classic one, uh, rammed earth, um, something that uh, is obviously you know also something that's been out there for for you know centuries um, and there's a good reason for it um, obviously there's also an interesting as aspect to to perhaps come up with hybrid solutions where um, I don't know rammed earth which is um, has higher compressive strength for example can be combined with 3d printing um, elements of, of, of building parts is that something that the program will initially also look at, or or is there a more sort of a um, not a really preset? not really? Even if you're giving very nice ideas, I think we're making a note. Um, we are of course looking at other techniques because they're interesting because they offer solutions. But we are very focused on three D printing. Uh, that is because first of all, we believe what we like about you know the flexibility of this tool is that is that we can do this here and do that, do this there. So there is possibilities, you know, even sometimes to to be able to go and locally reinforce a part of a of a, of a print, maybe even potentially with another material. So we believe that three D printing can do so many things. Uh, so we are trying to push its use to the max and to diversify its use. Um, but also another reason is that 3D printing is, an, is, a, is a very difficult technology to, to, to design and to, and to work with. So let's say we kind of have enough on our plate uh, to start to look and to combine it with, another, with other techniques. But I'm, I, I find it extremely, extremely nice idea. And I, and I hope and I really believe that this is something that should be done. Uh, it's just that I think the program that we do and that we design is, is, is very specialized. Uh, within 3D printing, uh, and it's already kind of a really big thing to have to learn uh, for us and, and also for the students. Okay, C can I one one follow up question, if that's okay? Um, just to, sure. um, um, since we we talked about it, so to to which extent is the the 3D printing technology that is taught as part of this course? Um, to which extent do you think can it actually transfer to other materials? So, for example, I, I guess. Clay is obviously there, which is very similarity, very similar in terms of its, let's say, yeah. uh, material uh, makeup, but also, I mean, other materials, uh, concrete. Um, to, to what extent sure. is, is that knowledge that you gain actually transferable to other materials? 
Very much so. Uh, I think I think that in, in this program we are looking very closely at 3D printing and, and that and that kind of this knowledge can be applied, you know, whether it's the whether it's the, the tool knowledge, whether it's the design knowledge, whether it's the coding knowledge, that can be applied to different ones. If you print with concrete, you will end up with a different design than if you print with earth, because for example, concrete doesn't retract in the same way, therefore you don't need to work with the same shapes. Uh, so there is, a, it, of course, it's not the same game. No, since we print with Earth, we do certain things. Um, but yes, this knowledge is absolutely applicable, not in a direct way, but but the knowledge that you gain, of course, can be used with uh, with other materials. Uh, mm -hmm. Surely, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? Also, if you're too shy, feel free to write them in the chat. I think, I think there is, Ant there is Ant yeah. Anton in the garden. I don't know if Anton was trying, but you're muted. We can't hear you. Hello? Can you hear Sorry. me? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. I'm Anton. Nice okay. to meet you. Actually, I have two questions. Um, could you please uh, tell me about this, the software you used? Uh, on, is it just Grasshopper or something else? Okay, uh, we use we use Rhino and Grasshopper. Uh, mm. Then sometimes we use a bit of Arduino. So uh, and and we like it because it's it's somehow it, these tools are incredible. They can do everything that we need. No, so there is a there is quite a lot of work in Rhino that we use a lot for drafting. Uh, you know, drawing is actually quite an essential. 3D yeah. printing is 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 drawing three dimensionally. So so we we really kind of insist on 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 on. On, on using that tool, uh, of course, Grasshopper is, is is absolutely necessary when it comes to doing the G code, but also to generating the geometries that you need in order to analyze them, in order to quantify uh, all of that. So, Rhino and Grasshopper are our our main tool. We can do almost everything that we need with them. Okay, and uh, uh, how do you connect uh, this Grasshopper G code with the robotic arms? Is it like uh, something special or the Base software. Yeah, yeah, we generate G code in Grasshopper, and that is something we feed directly to the robot. Whether it's right. whether we work with a robotic arm or whether we work with a crane, crane that you have seen in the in the last slides of the presentation. Great, thank you. And one more question: Haven't you discovered uh, like clay uh, with the process of firing? Because it's actually the same material, but after the firing process, it will be like, yeah. ten or twenty times uh, more durability. Haven't you sure. researched that? Yeah, we are researching the pavilion we've done at the Venice Biennale was done uh, with fired clay, and we've also done a collaboration with with an association of ceramics some years ago for the, the Biennale of Ceramics here of Catalonia, where we worked actually with a kind of double column, so so mm -hmm. so that where where the column was the oven itself, and we've worked in in this kind of very deep experiment of how to fire, and we reach actually uh, uh, vitrification and a very and a very strong result. Um, we tend to not go there explicitly because we are trying to work with we keep the material uh recyclable right because and this came from in in the beginning of the in the beginning of the research you know what we did is we made a prototype and then we broke the material we broke the prototype and we use exactly that material directly back into the pump mm -hmm. so we kind of experience within our own lab uh, this idea of, of 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 extremely simple recyclability, and we of course like this a lot more. The moment you fire the clay, not only you need a lot of energy, but then also the clay is not recyclable in order to do new prototypes. But what I think we most believe is is that you know is is I I really like to believe uh, or to think about the three D printed uh, wall with raw earth that might be cladded. Uh, with uh, ceramic tiles that are also 3D printed. I think that these things are absolutely combinable. So, so yes, uh, why not? Why not? Why not? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for information. Great conference. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Anton. I, I believe uh, Badia was trying to say something previously. Um, I have a question. Please go ahead. Then. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for this lovely presentation. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to start this uh, course in IAC. 
Um, but I have a question regarding the texture of the the texture after it's three uh, D printed. Is there a way mm -hmm. to like render it or to change in the stacking form, or is it uh, does it stay as is? Yes, I th that, that's a very nice question. And actually, Tova that I showed at the end of the presentation has an interior has an interior no that we don't have featured on the photographs and. Right now, we are starting to render the the inside with a with a with a kind of natural plaster. Um, and for me, it's a very nice it's a very nice question because you know, like when we three D print, sometimes it's difficult to think about how how does this really become a house because we're sometimes locked in the geometry or locked into the performance or thinking about some some let's say very very complex problems. But to to think that. Because of course our objective is to make houses for ourselves. No, I really want to live in a three D printed house, and I don't want to live in a in a cave. I want to live in a house that is that is bright and that is well finished. Um, and but when we are what we're doing with Tova at the moment is we're leaving the exterior as it is because it does the job and therefore it's rough uh, and it has the and it has the lines of the three D printing. And then inside we are rendering in order to create a space that is very domestic and that is very similar in a way to the house that you live in or the house that I live in. So I believe that there is this, this huge amount of work to be done on the finish, on the texture. Uh, of course, it's not so easy because we need to work with materials that work together with clay, you know, that enable the earth to keep on breathing, to absorb humidity, to reject humidity, and not to basically create a kind of uh, synthetic uh, closing or metric closing of the surface. So there is there, again, a lot of antique knowledge. Uh, we are working at the moment, not with contemporary, or not with masons that use contemporary techniques, but with masons that use old techniques, uh, that are kind of pre uh, pre synthetic or, or pre or pre petrol techniques, uh, which is something that we really love. No, how new technologies are are actually calling us to work with very old uh, knowledges. So, but I like that you asked this question because we we. we sometimes we can forget no we get so lost into a detail or we get so lost into a simulation that we forget that actually we have to live in there and how does it need to look like for all of us to feel comfortable within it so that more and more people live in these houses yeah, exactly. okay mm -hmm. thank you very great. much are you are you joining the program you said yeah ah great very nice mm -hmm. <laughs> so see you soon see you soon hopefully <laughs> Uh, hi, I also have a question. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, my question is regarding the experiment with the materials. So in um, in what I, I see, I saw a lot of uh, experiments or just ideas and research um, regarding the geometry that is going to be printed, but um, sometimes uh, the material also has a big impact mm. on the end geometry uh, that um, that is our goal so if sometimes so like the mixture of the uh, of the earth has also an impact on geometry and I just wanted to ask uh, will there be workshops um, that where we can explore different different yeah. mixtures and um, yeah, absolutely. So we do this normally quite the beginning of the course because uh, there are some of the students that come that have prior knowledge in that and, and others that don't. And we normally do a very nice workshop, which we do in the natural park here in Barcelona, uh, where we actually go and explore in the landscape uh, different different parts of the mountain. You know? and, and, uh, and we do that with shovels and with, uh, and with uh, how this tool is called, I don't remember, the pico in, uh, in Spanish. Uh, and then we organize ourselves as a collective you know, with the 20 students that, that we have. Then, then what we do is we try to catalog the landscape and understand the, and understand the landscape. So get back these, 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 um, these samples of earth and then go back into, into the lab and start to work with them with these very basic um, tests uh, on the earth to be able to, to understand the containing of clay, uh, the, the elasticity, the retraction of the material. So we make this cigar test. Uh, we made a water bottle test, we do this, but then we try to somehow gather all of this information and also uh, also quantify it and, and, and start to, uh, to, to do charts uh, to be able afterwards to insert this within the design. Um, 
afterwards they are so we normally work with the clay of barcelona at the moment we have some 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 projects that are starting in africa and and of course for these projects that sorry they are not part of the academic program because we do uh, little by little more and more projects on the site uh, very often with our alumni um, but for example for for this project in africa the first thing we will start to do is actually to 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 go there and to test the earth, not to see actually what is the what is the potential there. I like what you say to say that if you work with this earth or you work with that earth, somehow what you will construct will be different. That is something we haven't explored yet, uh, and I think it's because there's such a complexity in the in the things that we need to work with that the material is some, something that we try to all every year work with quite a similar material. Uh, and we haven't somehow completely opened that. But I think that this is something that, uh, that will definitely happen one day. Uh, and, and, and who knows, maybe already in the months to come. Um, yeah, I think it's a nice question. And again, we are making a note because I think these are very nice mm -hmm. suggestions of, of how to continue the research. Um, I also have one more quick question uh, regarding the horizontal layering of the uh, uh, of the geometries, um, you also sure. said that, um, we can have like an overhang, but uh, with the machines, we can also deviate a little bit from the horizontal. So, would you um, push us in a in such a direction uh, where we can yep. also experiment? Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Maybe, maybe for the ones that are less familiar with this, there is a construction technique that is called the Nubian fold. Uh, which is a very beautiful old technique where, where basically the arches of the vault are not vertical, they are slightly angled so that the brick take advantage of gravity, you know, so you can construct a vault without any formwork. So this is the technique that we've done, and I'm pretty sure we're not the only ones. We've actually taken the, the printer and we've taken it out of the horizontal plane, as you, as you say. So that is something we really like to do because it's a better way to build. Of course, it relates a little bit to the technology that we use. So if we work with a robotic arm, that's, I was gonna say very easy to do, it's not the case, but at least it's possible to do it. But if we work with a crane, that is a slightly more standard and the machine basically that has less functions than a robotic arm, then there, that is something that is much more tough to do. So there is always this kind of reality check of the technology we work with, where do we work the material, et cetera, that lead us into you know, one solution or the other. But I think what you're saying is definitely a, a very interesting ground that we are sometimes exploring. And I, I do believe we haven't explored enough. So, so, so there will be more on that for sure in the future, surely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rovesela, and nice to see you as well. <laughs> we have another question in the Q&A, uh, Edward, yes. from uh, Dua. I'm, I'm looking at it. I can maybe, I can maybe answer this. Uh, I was going to answer, we have two questions for everyone. Uh, if you would like to hear the answer and then Edward, of course, if you have uh, more to say about it. So um, so the, maybe I'll, I'll go for the first question where um, Dua is asking if in the program we teach about piping, wiring and integration with 3D printing. Uh, I'm assuming if you mean how we integrate 3D printing with Earth on regular 3D printers, yes. as um, Edward was explaining in the beginning of the program, we have a phase that is very technical and intensive. It's called Technic. In one of those weeks, you we have a one week seminar on the machine. It's basically a seminar where you learn how to hack a printer to be able to print with um, clay or earth materials. Um, I don't know if Edward, if about this, you have anything to add? I think I would just add, because I'm, I'm understanding this question slightly differently. I think there's two ways to understand it. And the other way is to understand whether we know we can use the cavities of a wall in order to insert, for example, services. Um, and that is something that, that, yes, we are very excited about. You know, we've done it when it comes to natural ventilation and we've done it when it comes to heat flows. But of course, we do believe that there is a huge opportunity in order to pass electricity uh, and to pass other other fluids. So, so, so yes, and I really like this question because I think this is what is going to give this technology uh, the, 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 the kind of reality that it needs. No, it's just not just doing about crazy, it's not just about doing crazy overhangs, it's also about being able to cater for the basic needs of what a house needs to do. So yes, these questions, we really like them. We really like to explore them. 
And I also invite you to look at some of the articles and blog posts that uh, we post because they do sometimes contain more detailed information about the, the architectural application. Um, the other question, which is a bit more related to uh, the content of the, of the program. So I was asking if the program is suitable for someone with no background in parametric design and grasshopper. Um, so the, the basic question is, Obviously, we always recommend someone who has been uh, accepted into the program that goes through the application process to um, until the program starts uh, to obviously go on a lot of tutorials and start, uh, let's say, get more familiar with the tools that will be used in the program. We do have a pre-course that is mandatory for anyone that comes from outside the school and does not necessarily have the necessary level of parametric design and grasshopper, um, just because the program is short and it's very intense. So we would like to give the opportunity for everyone in the program to have the the you know the level to be able to to basically grasp as much of the information and be involved in all the steps of the of the curriculum uh, equally. Um, now, obviously, this depends on each person and this will be assessed by the directors to further assessed by the directors during the interview um, right. the interview process yeah i think i think it's the, 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 you answered perfectly yara i think that what we lack in the in the program to have a certain balance between people that are you know really driven by technology and really driven by code for example and others that are maybe more driven by by other architectural concerns, no, a little bit less familiar, maybe a little bit less agile. Um, we do definitely want to make sure that everybody learns these tools during the during the program. But every year there are some students that that, that take part that are a little bit less less knowledge in Grasshopper. So um, I think Grasshopper, of course, you need to be interested into what it is. If you are scared of it, then. Then that's probably not a very good uh, start. Um, but at least you can be a little bit weak at the beginning of the program. Where we find it very important to be fluent is Rhino. Rhino is a tool that we used, you know, and, and, and from the beginning. And then I think all of you that have gone through architectural education are familiar with drafting softwares. So it's quite easy actually to jump to Rhino. And I think. Um, the, the, the experience we've had in the past when a student, you know, would hide a little bit the fact that they're not comfortable with Rhino and, and would comment, uh, that gave them a lot of difficulties. So Rhino, it, it, we, we, we expected a little bit like, you know, like driving a car and, and you need to have experience within it. You, you need to do a few projects and you need to come around the 1st of, of September for the beginning of the program. Uh, being very comfortable with that. And then there is no problem and then it's fine. But that I think is, very, is something that is very important. Um, we have in the chat another question. Montserrat, I believe we did uh, get in touch, I think, at some point by email. Um, so you're asking if, so Montserrat is a bachelor in product engineering in the Netherlands and is asking if he can take the course uh, for half a year alone or together a whole two year course. The postgraduate, uh, and 3D printing is an independent course. So of course you can apply for it and take it alone. However, um, because it is a postgraduate, we mainly accept people who already have a master's degree and generally people with only a bachelor are recommended to take a master's degree in house at the school. And then, uh, so for one year, which is a nine month course and then take the six months of 3DPA. Um, so to combine both, uh, but again, it is uh, a lot of a case by case uh, scenario that would also be assessed by the directors themselves, uh, based on, of course, on the study of portfolio, uh, once you go through the application process. Mm -hmm. And there is also the possibility to do a master's degree, to do, a, to do another master before joining 3DPA, you know? Yes, uh, so in house or out or, or in another school. True. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Buja, you had a question? Yes. Uh, 
Um, oh, we, we heard you, but now we don't hear you anymore. Take your time maybe to fix your microphone. If that doesn't work, you can always type the question, huh? Any other questions in the meantime? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Hannah. Yes. yes. Hi. Hi. So good to see uh, to see you, Edward. I haven't seen you before. <laughs> and thank you for a very nice yes, presentation. Absolutely. <laughs> so I think it's a bit of a delay. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for a very nice presentation, and it's a uh, yeah, it's super interesting to hear some more details about the program and to see your slides as well. So thank you very much for that. I have to go now. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll see you around. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Anna. Thank you for for coming, and and, and thank you for your words. We'll be in touch. Yes. Good to, bye -bye. See, you, Good to see you too. Bye. 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 So I'm also going to have to jump out because I need to go into another meeting. But before I go, I'm going to leave you here with Yara and Edward for the last question. Before I go, uh, just keep in mind that whoever is interested in applying, the application period now will close on the 31st of May. That is not That's not the end of the world. There's still some uh, open positions in the program. But if you want to, let's say, ensure a higher probability in entering the program, we highly recommend that you apply before the 31st of May. After the 31st of May, we will see how many spots are open. We'll have to decide whether the applications uh, will stay open or not. Uh, that being said, uh, always feel free to contact me. Um, I'm going to drop my email here in the chat. Any questions you might have on the application process, uh, please contact me or Yara. We'll be more than happy to help you out. Um, Yara, Edward, uh, everyone, thank you so much for this great event. Uh, and talk to you soon. Alex, thank Alex. you so much. Uh, so I guess we have the last question from Puja, who's saying, uh, I come from India, a developing country, and you mentioned about a few projects in Africa. And uh, Puja would like to understand how economical are these buildings in terms of costing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pooja. I think it's it's a it's a very important question you ask. It's a difficult one to answer, um, but but it's it's of course it's absolutely essential to to dwell on that question. Um, at the moment, it's very expensive, right? Because we need for for several reasons. First of all, because we need equipment that is not equipment that many companies are fabricating and it's equipment that is still relatively let's say pioneered or relatively beta it's the beginning of this technology and then at the same time it's also it requires a lot of um uh, a lot of people to work on this no? so in order in other words in order to design a building you don't do it with one or two architects you need to do it with a few a uh, few architects, uh, plus someone that knows about robots, someone that knows about materials, someone that knows. So that means that there is more salary. So at the moment, the equipment is expensive, and there is and there is knowledge to be constructed. So therefore, there's more salary. So this is a technique that today is is more expensive than than uh, than reinforced concrete uh, or also around earth. The more we work through this, the cheaper it's going to become because the more we're going to find ways to 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 optimize it. So we and and this I have zero doubt about because the material is free, right? Uh, and you know the the printer, um, the printer is not much more expensive than uh, than a concrete mixing truck. So if you start to get into it, you realize that little by little, uh, this cost will go down. But of course, it requires the economy of scale. Of course, it requires the fact that many people investigate with that. And I hope that all of you that don't join the don't join the program here will uh, still 3D print with us somewhere because I think we all need to contribute to this technology and this material because I think it's it's a very good solution for for the future. So the the. I'm, I am. I have zero doubt that it will become a viable uh, uh, construction alternative from an economical point of view. 
but we need to work through it in order to make that happen. That's, uh, that's my answer. Great, great question. I think it's essential. If we don't answer that question, we cannot go further. Absolutely. So we have a, sorry. No, no, go ahead. There's one more question. We have question, a follow-up right? question, yes. Uh, what is your, your main pains or like challenges with the equipment? Uh, we are working on building equipment. Great. Oh, there are quite a few. I love the questions, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Anton. Very nice. Um, the material, so, so extracting the material, drying the material, sieving the material, mixing the material with fibers, uh, and then pumping the material. These are things that definitely can improve, uh, uh, you know, like getting, getting a really good pump. That is something that is money, but uh, if we don't have a good pump, we have to do it ourselves. And, and, and we've had that in the past, and that's always very tough. Um, and then when it comes to equipment, we work with a wasp brain. That is a tool that is uh, that is um, that is a very nice tool. It's not uh, it's 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 a tool that is this printer is reasonably new. Let's say I mean wasp has been printing quite a lot with it over the past three or four years, uh, or maybe even more, maybe five six years. And we've been printing with it for three years, and we're very happy with it. It's it's a tool that needs its tweaking sometimes bits and pieces go wrong, but what I like about it is that we can kind of fix it ourselves. And I think that is quite, this is quite important. No, I think we, we, we're not after having tools like iPhones at the moment, something is broken. You don't know what to do with it. We like to have tools that are very porous uh, and that we can manipulate ourselves. Um, but I, I do believe that there is so many things that can, that can improve. It's hard to give a kind of more specific answer because it's like, it, it's, it's like, we would need a, quite a long meeting for that, no? Or even to be on site together. So, so, so of course, feel free to come and uh, and see us if you uh, if you work on on the equipment because I think we we, I mean, there is definitely a very nice kind of iterative process of developing equipment while we work with it and we discover problems. Uh, 